Hello, my name is Ashley and I'm the current co-op student with the UBC Dynamic Brain Circuits Cluster. Today I will be showing you how to go through the phenograph tutorial package that Pankaj and I made. All right, let's get into it. So first things first, you're going to come to the GitHub and you're going to download the repository in a zip, preferably in a zip file. After that, you're going to open it up in Syzygy, and then I'll show you how to go through each of the individual steps to obtain the result that you are looking for. So here's the tutorial package. This tutorial, I'm going to go through the 3D data. However, as you can see that there's also the option for 2D data. Once you've opened it in Syzygy, I do recommend opening and running these three files because in the notebooks that either 2D or 3D, they're going to call functions from these files. So it's just a good form of habit to run these files first. So going back to the tutorial package, I'll walk you through each of the individual steps. And I've run it before, so I won't be running it necessarily together with you, but I'll, you can pause the video as it's going through because some of these functions do take a bit longer. So first things first is you're going to run all of these installations. So here you're going to install all the needed packages, all the needed methods, and here's we're installing some of the Phenograph GitHub repository from the where Phenograph is sourced from. Moving forward, you're going to import OS, which is a basic package that you should be familiar with. And then most importantly, we're going to go to the data route and set our data path. Now, as you can see here, I have Phenograph tutorial is one of the first, is the first package or first folder in my Syzygy directory. So if I was to click to this, it would go back to my Syzygy homepage. So here I have Phenograph tutorial, and then I put dot dot, which is the starting for Syzygy, and then I put Phenograph tutorial, which is the name of my folder. As you can see here in this tutorial, if I had a, if this folder was inside another folder, I would put in the name of that one before it. And if I was referring to the data that is after this folder, so say this is the first folder and then I have another folder inside which I'm running the code, I would put the name of that after. Basically, you have to tell the code and you have to tell the package where to look for all this stuff exactly. You need to make sure your spelling and capitalization does count. So after you run all this, um, I'm just making sure it runs again. You're going to go here and do you remember how we ran function file here? Well, now that it's up and running, you can import the methods from there. So that's good. Next is data formatting. This is really important. So if I were you, I would open up your sample of your data in an Excel spreadsheet and you'll get, it'll look something like this. This is from the data, the sample data that I will be using. So in this case, my data starts at row three and my indices at, and columns start at row zero. Sometimes, depending on how you've imported or recorded your data, these numbers will different, be different. It is important to know that Python is a zero numbered code set. So that means instead of going one, two, three, four, it goes zero, one, two, three. So even though this is the quote unquote fourth row, it is header number three and which my data begins. Next, we're actually going to import this data. So here I'm only using one file, but if you, you were to use multiple different files, you would put it in this array uh, as detailed here in this explanation, but I'm only using one. And this is the name of the, the data that I'm reading from. So sample 3D data. So it's important that you get the name right, and it's important that it's in the folder path that you had specified before. So after you run that, I'm gonna go down here, and this is where you would put in header. So for my example, I use header equals three, because that's where my data starts. And this is a for loop that is gonna run for the amount of times that you have, for the amount of times or the length of your array. So I only have length one, so it's only gonna run once, but if you had multiple different files within that array, it would run that amount of times. This is the typical setup for deep lab cut and the index column is equal zero. So since there's no uh, index underscore call equals zero, 
our index, there's no index indication, it just assumes that it's zero. So if I wasn't to put a header, header here, it would throw up an error because it's going to try and read from header equals zero. And there, there's going to be words, not numbers, and read CSV isn't like that. Next, you're going to exclude the index column because that's not actually data that you want, but it is important for later on. Now you're going to tell the NumPy array which uh, type of data you're reading in. So you're reading a float type. It's also uh, very common for when, when working with deep lab cut to delete every third column. This is because I'm pretty sure the third column is the probability in which the object is in that area, and that's not really relevant for clustering. But anyway, so you'll run this code. I've already ran it. And then you're going to come down here to which is this is some of the this is the part where it actually clusters things. So clustering here works that you're going to cluster the X, Y, and Z coordinates. If you're doing 2D, you're only clustering the X and Y coordinates. Next, you're going to set the K value. I've used K equals 30. From my understanding, that's a pretty standard K value. But K is the number of nearest neighbors to use in the first type of graph construction in phenograph. I suggest that you try different numbers from 10 to 100, depending on your sample size and the number of expected clusters. K, it's important to note that K is not the amount of clusters that you're going to end up with. It's the amount of neighbors that each individual point has to have. It, doesn't, it might not make sense, but if you run it a couple times with different K values, you're going to get a different number of clusters, different shapes and sizes of clusters. So I suggest you play around until you get a result that kind of looks or makes sense to you or in the data that you're looking for. Next, I just plotted this. You don't have to run these two codes here under communities and correlation if you just want the image, but this kind of helps me visualize and understand what's going on. So here we're just plotting all the communities for each part. So this, this graph itself doesn't mean a whole bunch, but here we're going to save the communities or cluster number into a spreadsheet uh, or a CSV file, sorry, in which each row will match up with the row in the original CSV file. So you can actually see which points line up to which cluster, which can be really helpful. And I'll go through that in a minute. So here we're going to data plot. So we're going to plot our clusters into a nice image. I've already ran this code before because it does take a couple of minutes. Um, it's important to note at the beginning of the, the file that I note what uh, CPU and sort of RAM you should be running this with, because especially if you're running multiple different data files, this can get pretty heavy on the computation side, so that is important to know. So I already have this image, so this code actually wouldn't even run if I tried to run it, because I have this name here. So this is the name that your image is going to save under. If this image already exists, None of these code, none of these code blocks will execute because they're always checking if not the, this image exists each time, and that's the image that you've set up here. So if you want to redo the image, you're either going to have to delete it or add like uh, I don't know underscore two something like that to then make it a different image that's going to output. But I'll walk you through here. So. This is the code that you would, this is the line of code that you would use if you, like me, only have one CSV file. If you have multiple, you just have to uncomment this file by doing that and then add a hash mark down there. This will uh, un or like not run that one line of code and now run the multiple lines of code for using multiple different data files, but since mine only has one file, we're just going to leave it like that. And here is making the pretty image. So again, if you already have an image named the one that you have there, it's not going to work. But this is using TSNI in order to actually plot it up. And here's your nice image. Very helpful, very nice. But you say, Ashley, it's a really nice image I have, but I don't, I can't tell which cluster or, or which data point belongs to each cluster. And that's why earlier we printed out the communities in the CSV form here. So header three will translate to row one or zero here. 
So the data point at row three, sorry, row four will be row zero here. Row five will be row one here. Row six will be row two here, so on and so forth. So the data points between, I guess, are all community one is community zero, community seven, goes all the way down. And now you can manually compare the data points. The ones or zeros are not relevant for you. It's just the number on the left side there. But yeah, that is a basic run through on how to use the Phenograph tutorial package. There is a 2D option. So be sure to use that if your data only includes two dimensions. And if you scroll through, each of the cell blocks has some explanation and read through the comments would be really helpful. And yeah, thank you so much for watching.